Peter and I used to always say like the institutions are coming. And of course we meant like the Goldman's and the cities. And we were right about the institutions coming. We were just wrong on the type. It's really the brands. All right, everyone. Welcome back to the first episode of Empire of 2023. Super excited to have uh, two of my favorite folks in the entire industry uh, on Empire kicking off the year with us. We have Colleen Sullivan and Peter Johnson, the co-leads of the venture team at Brevin Howard Digital. And we've got Santi co-hosting this up with us. I just want to make sure everyone knows like all, all opinions in this episode expressed by Colleen or Peter or myself or Santi uh, are, are solely our own personal opinions. They don't reflect the opinions of Brevin Howard or Brevin Howard Digital. No opinion should be expressed as a in, uh, inducement to make a, pr a particular investment or follow a particular strategy. Uh, these are all just opinions. This podcast is for informational purposes. We are really ramping up the legal side of things in 2023 as regulatory stuff perhaps uh, cr cracks down. So Empire, you're going to hear uh, potentially a few more disclaimers than usual. So Peter and Colleen, I thought it'd be an interesting way to kick this off. You guys made 15 predictions for the year. And I, I really do want to make sure we touch on each of those. So we're going to spend like maybe five minutes on each of the predictions for this episode. But I actually want to start by just like really high level framework. So Colleen, maybe and I want to pick on both you guys for this opening question. Colleen, can you just give us your like high level framework of how like how you are thinking about crypto going into 2023, what you think this year looks like? Yeah, I mean, I'm incredibly optimistic about 2023, which may sound strange coming off of 2022. As an investor in the space, I feel like obviously we see valuations coming down. We see the people that are really here because of the technology are the ones who stay. Um, we've seen, you know, because Peter and I have been through, I think this is our third bear market at this point. And when I think about 2018 and 2019, there just wasn't that much built. You know, we didn't have the brands that we have in the space today. We don't have the financial institutions that we have in the space today. And things are really working today. So we've got um, a much higher foundation than the last bear market. So I couldn't be more excited, which, you know, I think most of our predictions are really optimistic. So you'll hear more about that as we go through them today. Mm -hmm. Peter, what about you? Yeah, I would, I would totally echo that in that I am incredibly excited about where we are today. And maybe that's different than some folks, but having gone through multiple cycles and seen, you know, 20... 13, 2014, it was, you know, all about Bitcoin. And then I would say most people thought like crypto was going to die. 2017, 2018, you had ICO boom. And then a lot of people thought crypto was going to die. And there wasn't, as Colleen mentioned, there wasn't really a lot that was built at that point. And then in this cycle, you actually had a ton of things that are launched and getting traction. You have DeFi, you have NFTs, you have stable coins, uh, you have brands coming into the space, like all of these like real meaningful traction that you didn't have the last times around. So I think this time it's most people don't think like, hey, crypto is going to go away. It's OK. Like, what is this cycle going to look like and how deep is it going to go and how long is it going to take? But like nobody thinks it's going anywhere. And we all I think most people that have been around realize, OK, like this is a fundamental technological innovation that you have true digital ownership. You have open network value transfer like that is not going anywhere. That's going to change the world in some way or another. And we're starting to see those changes in payments and branded goods and gaming and all of these things that we're going to talk about. Um, so if you believe that, hey, this is going to change the world, then as an investor, like, when do you want to be investing? Do you want to be investing top of the hype cycle or in a trough? Like, obviously, you want to be investing in a trough. So we're in a great time to be investing right now. Um, and for me and Clean, like, one, thrilled to be working with Clean, like, one of the best investors in the world. So just thrilled to have partnered up with her this year. Um, we're at Brevin Howard, which I think is a great place to be. So feel great about the industry, feel great about timing, feel great about our team. Um, overall, like just feeling really good. Just got a couple of optimists here uh, <laughs> here on the show. So I, I love it. Um, I think let's, so when I was, I really liked your guys' predictions, which is why we wanted to have you on the podcast. So I think let's start with the infrastructure side of things, because Peter, you just mentioned payments there. And the, the first prediction that you guys had was, uh, stable coin volumes surpass visa volumes. So I'm curious as to, I'd love to just hear Peter, you make this prediction and, and expand on why this is kind of your, the, the first one that you guys put out there. Yeah. So for me, this is a big one. And this is something that I, and we have been paying attention to for a long time. And that stable coins, I think are fairly clearly one of the first like real killer apps for crypto in that for the first time ever, anyone in the world 
has access to dollars, can save in dollars, can spend in dollars, transact in dollars. And there is insatiable demand around the world for dollars. And stablecoin is how that demand is, is being met. And we, we've seen the growth of stablecoins uh, over the last few years. It's really only been a few years that they've really had any meaningful um, usage, but, it, but it's really exploded over the last four or five years. Um, and this year in 2020, um, stablecoins on-chain, stablecoin settlement volume. So this excludes uh, on-exchange volumes, just actual on-chain volumes, uh, was about $7 trillion in volume. And I think that most people don't realize that that's already significantly larger than MasterCard, which is at about $2 trillion, uh, Amex, which is at, at about a trillion, Discover, which is $200 billion, um, and it's getting close to Visa, which is the largest payment network in the world, uh, our, our largest card network in the world, uh, which settles about $12 trillion a year. So it's a pretty short uh, leap at this point for stable coins to surpass Visa and to surpass all uh, of the major card networks combined. And I think that that was a, a stat that we put out there that I think a lot of people didn't realize and it caught their attention um, because it just shows the scale uh, that stable coins are at. And I think that the uh, that's really just the start of where mm -hmm. stable coins are going to be. I think it's a good comparison point because you know Visa and, and these card networks are processing a lot of volume, but the real, the kind of the final bosses that stable coins are going to come for it's the like wholesale uh, money movement networks, so like ACH and Fedwire, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's actually really impressive. You can compare it to those networks, and ACH is doing seventy trillion dollars a year. Fedwire is doing like a quadrillion dollars a year. Big numbers. But that means stablecoins are already doing 13% of ACH volumes, 1% of Fedwire volumes. Like that's kind of crazy. Like the world financial system runs on Fedwire and stablecoins are already doing 1% and they're only mm. a few years old. Mm. So I think that we are just at the beginning of stablecoins really changing how money moves across the world. Um, and, and that's something that, that we're really excited about. We spent a lot of time on that. Hmm. I really like that prediction. I think my only pushback potentially would be like MasterCard and Visa and Discover and those folks, those volumes are sourced from consumer spending. But I think a lot of stablecoin volume is, um, is more like trading and investing or like specu speculatory, I would say. I'm curious about how you think about comparing like two buckets that maybe aren't perfect. Uh, comparisons. Yeah, they're definitely imperfect comparisons, um, but I do think it is. It, it, it one, it gives a sense of scale on making the comparison, and two is that I think a lot of people look at stable coins and they just said, "Oh, oh this is all speculation." Um, and we've looked into that some, and we don't believe that's true. And if you look at where stable coins are held. Uh, earlier this year, we, we took a look at where are stable coins? Are they held on exchanges? Are they in smart contracts? Are they in non-custodial wallets? Because uh, that gives, it does, it's not an exact science, but it gi gives you a sense of how stable coins are being used. And this was in, we looked at it in October of this year, and um, only 8% of USDC and 25% of USDT was held on exchanges. Put that together, less than 20% of stable coins are actually held on exchanges. Um, you have another percentage that's in smart contracts, but then the majority of stable coins, uh, over half of USDC and over 60% of USDT are held of, it's outside of exchanges, outside of smart contracts. Um, those numbers are actually going to be higher now because a lot of people have removed their stable coins off of exchanges. But even at that time, you say, okay, these are coins that very likely are not being used purely for speculation because they're not on exchanges and they're not in smart contracts. And you can also look at the distribution of holdings and um, at least on Ethereum, 75% of wallets that hold stable coins hold less than $100 of stable coins. So these are, it's not just, hey, these are a bunch of big market makers that hold these and they're moving it between exchanges. It's a lot of small dollar accounts that people are held, holding uh, often in non-custodial wallets, which to me indicates that these are being used for something other than just speculation. Would you say that the, from a sort of KPI standpoint, what is more important to you? Is it total transaction volume? Is it average, um, like number, like frequency or volume or size? Uh, you know, because a lot of times folks have multiple wallets, and so it's it's difficult to track that. But it, would you rather see 
I guess the question is, would you rather see average transaction value, like average holdings in wallets grow? Or would you rather see total number of wallets grow? I mean, it's not mutually exclusive, but what to you, when you think about this category and prediction, what is more interesting, important to you? Yeah, I think that the like the number that we put out there as far as transaction volume is meaningful because it's, it's an eye-catching stat. And I think the comparison there is eye-catching. Um, I think what I'm most excited about is the non-speculative usage. And that is probably things more like number of wallets that are active and transacting is going to be more indicative of, of what you're actually seeing there for non-speculative usage. Hmm. Last question on this bucket, and then we'll go to the, and prediction number two. Do you think, who do you think wins this, the, the stablecoin game? USDC, I think, has a, a pretty dominant lead here. Do you, uh, uh, overall, maybe, a, maybe a better question than that, Peter, because I, I had a feeling you were going to say yeah. USDC. Is, do you think we'll see a real competitor in the maybe like the algorithmic stablecoin space in, in the, like basically a non-USDC competitor? Uh, like a non-centralized uh, yeah, competitor? Yeah. I, I really don't think so. Not in a meaningful yeah. way. I wish that was not true. Like I would love to see a more decentralized stablecoin um that much more fits with the ethos of, of crypto and it would be great to have um i think realistically um regulators uh don't like algorithmic stable coins uh people don't really trust them after luna it's going to be hard for uh non-centralized stable coins to get significant traction and and on one hand that that's somewhat of a it's a bummer uh because there is centralization there um but it also is it's it's somewhat centralized, but it still is an open system. And these are still open network dollars, which is completely different than the current system, which are, is completely closed network. If you want to onboard into dollars right now, you have to have a bank account or be part of the Fedwire system or Zelle. Everything is closed network. Uh, stable coins, even if they are issued by a centralized party, these are open network dollars. And I think that that is the most important point. Yep. All right. So your, your response to Santiago is that one of the most important metrics that you're looking at is the number of wallets, the number of active wallets. Colleen, I think I'd throw num prediction number two to you, which is um, this bucket of digital goods, right? Prediction number two that you that you had was brands bring millions of new users to Web3 and generate over 500 million from NFTs. So this, I think is that brands alone will generate over 500 million from NFTs. Would love to hear you expand on this prediction. Yeah. So, well, okay. I listened to you on um, a podcast this weekend. You mentioned the Starbucks Odyssey program. We actually had a lot of similar predictions for the year, which I, there was another one. Um, Yeah. We had a, uh, about like uh, OpenSea and um, yeah. uh, Uniswap. And uh, so I, we, we actually overlap with some of these predictions, but yeah. Okay. I'd love to hear you, you talk about this. Yeah. So, okay. Here's the way I think about things. Um, and I think Starbucks is an interesting one to start with because, um, well, first of all, they're not new to Web3. I think a lot of people forget that they invested in Bact in 2018. So part of me wonders if uh, the Starbucks Odyssey is the Odyssey name is indicative of the journey they've taken over the last four years to sort of find product market fit within Web3. So Starbucks has 27 million loyalty members that they're going to be introducing to Odyssey. And Odyssey, obviously built on Polygon, um, if you take a closer look at it, it's really a game. It's very much like Pokemon Go, where you have to complete certain challenges and you get stamps. So Starbucks is calling NFT stamps. Um, and then those lead to rewards and experiences. So that's Starbucks, right, with its 27 million. And then you've got Instagram coming out with its product for creators that is also built around NFTs on Polygon. That's 2 billion users. Then you get into Reddit. Reddit has, I think, 50 million daily active users, and they've built out their digital collectibles program with their NFTs. So we're just seeing more and more of the brands engaging in this space. And, um, you know, so that is sort of the foundation that this piece is built on. You know, Peter and I used to always say, like, the institutions are coming. And of course, we meant like the Goldman's and the cities. And we were right about the institutions coming. We were just wrong on the type. It's really the brands. Um, so we've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, why is that? Why are the brands willing to innovate over here, especially brands like Tiffany's um, and Gucci? You know, they've been around for over 100 years. And, I, you know, we think that it's because they're not afraid to take risk, meet their customers where they are. And Gen Z, Gen Alpha 
digitally native, you know, this is where their future customers reside. Um, and so that's really the foundation that this prediction is built on. We just see a tremendous amount of engagement here, and it's opening up net new revenue monetization streams for these players. So you've got, you know, and I heard you talking about fidgetals, right? So you've got a brand like Gucci that today is within Roblox selling $5 purses to kids playing that game. But as those kids grow older and their purchasing power increases, it's going to be a $5,000 fidgetal. So a physical bag with an NFC or RFID chip within it tied to an NFT. And importantly, you'll be able to bifurcate those. But through that microchip tied to blockchain, um, you'll be able to verify the authenticity of that project, you'll be of the product, you'll be able to verify from a sustainability standpoint where the materials came that built that product. Um, so it's really, you know, and, and then you're going to have like just direct to avatar commerce where you don't have the fidgetal, but just the NFT item that the avatar will wear in the metaverse environment. So um, that, you know, that's the origin of that particular prediction. Hmm. Do you, uh, I actually think this ties, I think my question ties in with your third prediction, which is the third prediction is Polygon's NFT volumes catch up to its business development, which is a really interesting prediction because it does seem like Polygon has basically won this, has like cornered the market for brands building in the, in the digital goods space. So I just, I'd love to hear you talk about like predictions for Polygon, agree or disagree that like they've won this niche. Um, and then maybe expand on, on on what that prediction actually entails. Yeah. So Polygon brought over a guy named Ryan Wyatt um, to head up Polygon Studios. And Ryan came out of YouTube. He led YouTube gaming. And he's phenomenal. He's a force of nature. Um, so I think what Polygon has done first and foremost is hired really well and built out a great team. Um, another really important factor is the merge. So all of these brands care about sustainability, like they really fundamentally care and their customers care. And it's important because post-merge, you can go into the ecosystem. So the Ethereum ecosystem, of course, which Polygon is built in, where you have all of the customers, the liquidity, the infrastructure, the safety, the security, and that leads to better experiences for brands and customers. So Polygon is sort of sitting in the middle of all of this. Um, and I think what we've seen thus far is fantastic business development, and now we're about to see execution. So that's the only, you know, sort of open question is, can they deliver? Can they execute as well as they've been able to bring in, you know, these companies and brands? Um, and I think the answer is going to be yes. Like, I, you know, Peter and I, our experience with the Polygon team is, you know, they're outstanding. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I think it's too early to say that they've officially won but they're in pole position for sure. Yeah. How do you two, so it sounds like you heard me mention on, on the other podcast, like I, I got the demo of the Starbucks platform and saw what's coming and it's super cool. And then like, I will say I have been very, um, I almost have like battle scars, I think from the 2017, like blockchain, not Bitcoin. Like I, was, I think I've been pretty anti corporates getting into crypto because I was just like, they don't know how to do it. They're not going to do it right. They always chase this thing. And then they and then they disband their teams a year later once we get into the bear market. But after seeing what Starbucks is doing, it kind of red pilled me, honestly. Um, but I also it kind of clicked that NFTs for brands, they're really nothing crazy. They're kind of just like loyalty programs on steroids, I would say. It's like, if you think about loyalty programs as something that has gotten better and better, but like marginally better and better over the years. This is like a 10, NFTs are like a 10X improvement on existing loyalty programs. I'm curious if you guys agree or disagree with like that framework for like brand-based NFTs. I think it's part of the framework. And I think it's a really important part of the framework because through these loyalty programs tied to NFTs, you go direct to your customer. So there's, there's no intermediary in between you and the customer anymore, and you can continue to feed them experiences and rewards. So I think that part is really important. But I also think there's the digital and the straight digital component. So, you know, we like to say that House of Gucci's biggest competitor isn't Prada, it's House of Fortnite. So Fortnite over the last four years has sold $20 billion worth of vir virtual goods. So emotes and cosmetics, skins, 
And that we expect to continue. I mean, that's why you've seen these brands go into games and sell digital goods for gaming avatars, whether that's skins or bags or whatever it may be. And I just know through my own kids that this concept of what is real and what is virtual is merged. Your friends in Fortnite, your friends in school, they're just friends. So again, it's, it kind of goes back to this younger generation where you have 75% of the kids in the United States, UK, New Zealand, Australia, and Canada um, in Roblox. Uh, so 50 million daily active users, um, 10 million people in there at a time. Like that, that, it's a different generation, and the brands know that they have to meet that generation where they are. So I think that direct to avatar commerce, just the pure digital items, will become really important. You want to flex hmm. in the metaverse or the environment that you're in, and then I do think fidgetals. I, I, I really think like we will look back in a few years and think it's odd that we ever bought like a streetwear or luxury good that didn't have an NFT tied to it. I think we're going to need a better name than Fidgetals, though. Oh, it's digital. terrible. And, and digital digital twins feels is like not a, good Yeah, we've like, heard so many. Yeah. We, yeah. I think, yeah. Our, the producer of Empire, shout out Garrett, was like, can you please not use the word Fidgetal on this podcast? I, I was like, I don't so know if bad. I can. Uh, <laughs> uh, if I could. If sort we of like back. fickle and fidgety. It's uh, yeah. Sort yeah, of it's not a connotation. <laughs> um, this, okay. I guess so, on, on, on this ahead, prediction. I'm just curious to take like what, where would you look at in terms of like what could derail Polygon or what could derail brands coming into the space? It's a good question um, because I've thought about this quite a bit in the sense that, uh, you know, does our investment thesis need to change after everything we've just gone through with FTX, um, all of the lender issues that we've had in 2022. And I kind of go back to like NBA Top Shot <laughs> and Dapper. And that was built during the bear market. Um, and I tend to think, so it, it's almost like if what we've been through in 2022 hasn't scared these big brands away and it doesn't appear to be doing that, like that is a great stress test for your question. And it doesn't feel, I mean, it's early, right? We're, we're still not even through that, but it doesn't feel like it's going to scare brands away. Like it's, um, I think again, like partly because there is this new avenue for monetization and revenue, like there's something really there. Um, so I, I don't, yeah. So I, I, yeah. I feel good about where we are with brands coming in and them staying in and it being sticky. Santi, it reminds me of something that we've talked about a lot, which is like this stuff only gets implemented when it's actually a better, when there's a business use case for it. Um, and like the biz, the business use case for, I'm going to use the word digital here, which is terrible, but like, or like digital goods or something like have basically having a digital good strategy in my mind is incredibly strong right now, which is if you're a brand you're worried about, I would be worried about one, one of maybe my big concerns would be like, how do I reach kids age like 17 and under or something like that because uh i think they're getting more and more wealth kids are getting wealthier and wealthier because they're able to make money online faster and faster and younger and younger and if you're a traditional brand like you basically have to make your experience very your product very experiential and your brand very experiential and nfts and like digital uh, having a strong digital good strategy is like the natural extension of that so well, it's kind of funny that point, and I know we need to move on, so I'll make it quick, but it's like with my kids coming up, they didn't want dollars. They wanted V-Bucks or Robux. Like they, they, mm -hmm. the concept of US dollars was kind of like, well, we're, I'm just going to convert it into digital dollars, you know, in my game anyway. So yeah. I don't want those. And I think for parents too, it's like, okay, well, you know, they can, the kids can buy something within a game. I don't have to like throw them in the car and take them to the store and like, go get this thing. Like it's just right there, right in front of you. The Wall Street Journal actually had a really good article on this where they also noted that kids are spending, I think it's age 12 to 17, $92 a month on online goods, most of those being virtual items. Um, so th again, it's just this generational shift that I think we're seeing with Gen Z and Gen Alpha. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just for stats purposes, I mean, you've got 
you're still seeing like 20, 25 billion dollars of NFT volume this year. Um, it's certainly tied to, you know, the activity happening in broader crypto, but it does feel like, you know, you're seeing some collections of NFTs just doing well in spite of the, you know, the current market conditions. And, um, you know, just for context, I mean, the market, just Gucci alone, certain brands are just generating, you know, not to, you know, in terms of size, it's just a drop in the bucket. Um, so you, if you bring on a luxury segment or just a gaming segment or just some sort of, not just retail, but other, all kinds of brands, it doesn't take much to see this volume go to a hundred billion, you know, 200 billion over the next five years. Um, so, you know, people will continue to spend and the trend towards digital and gaming, people like to be entertained in, in bull and bear markets. So, yeah. There was another there was another prediction that ties into some of the stuff that Santiago's talking about and what what Colleen you were mentioning with like V Bucks. Um one of the predictions, I think it was number six or seven, was talking about gaming studios integrating NFTs into existing games. And um I think you laid out these like four stages of how that will happen. I'd love to hear one of you. I don't know, Colleen, if you want to continue on this, um, or or if Peter, you want to jump in, but would love to hear you kind of expand on these four stages. Sure. Yeah. And it's it's really stages that we've seen. Um, you know, we started investing in Web3 and gaming in 2018. And so it's it's um I would say like stage one was really and this is all specific to web two game developers and publishers, but really the first step was kind of monitoring what was going on, almost like um having little incubators. And Ubisoft was really the first one that we saw do this, where they had the Entrepreneurs um, Lab Accelerator, and they would admit Web3 gaming studios. So I think it was an interesting way for Ubisoft to kind of monitor, like, what are they doing? What does crypto do for games? Should we be paying attention to this? So it was stage one. Stage two was investing in Web3 gaming startups to get just that much closer and really understanding what's going on behind the scenes. So here we saw Take Two, um, the creator of GTA, invest in Horizon Blockchain Games. Ubisoft also did. And notwithstanding Tim Sweeney's cryptocurrency tweet from last week, Epic Games has invested in Manticore's um, last two rounds. And Manticore is essentially a competitor to Roblox, building out metaverse um, tooling for user-generated content. And they've added in Web3 tools for creators. Epic also offers core on the Epic Games Store. So, you know, we're we're seeing this activity in stage two. Stage three is where we see um, Web2 game developers set up specific subsidiaries for crypto games, Web3 games. So essentially wanting to bifurcate that a little bit away from the parent company, you know, whether that's for legal reasons, because a crypto game may have tokens and NFTs, and you don't want that potential liability to flow up, or it's because of some of the gamer backlash we've seen against NFTs. But that was a structure that Peter and I saw a decent amount last year. And we think this is going to be the year where you don't necessarily need that subsidiary, where you start to add just some elements of crypto, whether that's adding USDC as a payment rail for crypto type purchases. Now, of course, that's not gonna be within the app store given everything that's going on, but for a web-based game, Um, or it's adding NFT elements, bits of ownership to the game. You know, we think that's where we'll start to move into in 2023. Mm. Do you think this will come from a tier one gaming company? Like um, leaning into crypto, like um, what are some uh, Sony or Microsoft or um, EA or Activision, Blizzard, Take-Two, one of those? Or is it going to come from like a tier two, tier three that says, "Uh, crap, we're falling behind and like, our best strategy here is leaning into crypto. You know, I I do think it will come from tier one. You know, we saw Mm -hmm. Ubisoft try to do this um, with its game Ghost Recon, where it added NFTs. And of course there was this big backlash, but Ubisoft has not given up. You know, they've said, the gamers just don't really understand the utility of NFTs and what that brings to them. That now they're going to own the assets. They're not sitting on Ubisoft servers anymore and they have secondary liquidity. And eventually, you know, because these assets are programmable and composable, they can plug into DeFi. You can rent, you can lend out, you can get liquidity through Uniswap. So, I mean, I I think that we will see, and I would view Ubisoft as a tier one gaming studio. I think that they will continue to push the envelope here 
and really open this up. And then I would be watching, you know, firms like Epic to see what they decide to do. Um, take two for sure. Um, so I, I think we'll see it from a tier one in 2023. Peter, can I ask you about the financialization of NFTs? Because that was something that really started to like catch a narrative, I guess I'd call it at the end of the last bull market is is really like, you know, lending against your, using NFTs as collateral, really like the financialization of your NFTs. There's a lot of risk associated with that. And now that we're on the other side of the, the, the bull market and a year into this bear market, you maybe look back at that and say, like, wow, that's probably actually a good thing that that didn't take off really. Um, I'm curious to get your take on if you think all these like in-game NFTs will... And like these brand NFTs, if like what the financialization around those looks like and what it should look like. Yeah, and I'm sure Colleen has had some good views on this as well. I think that there's there's like different angles to the financialization or financial products that are being built around NFTs. There's things like uh, like buy now, pay later, which I think are makes a lot of sense as NFTs are increasingly um, you know consumables and they're not investments. It's a, you know, it's something that you want to you know, buy. It's like a luxury good or a fashion good, and you want to pay for that over time. And that, that completely makes sense. Um, things like lending, like borrowing against your NFTs, uh, I think probably makes sense for some of the higher value items. You know, things like CryptoPunks or Fidenzas that are really like high-end artwork um, in some sense. So putting those types of products, I think, around them do make sense or could make sense. Uh, there's things like the fractionalization of NFTs. I think that that's a little bit tougher, especially as you get into the securities potential issues around there. But I think it depends on which like financial product you're looking at. And some of them make sense and some I think it will probably have some issues. Santi, would you ever use your your punks or any other maybe like valuable NFT you have as collateral? Or does that feel like too risky to you? Uh, it depends. There are some which I will definitely not. Uh, and I'm an investor in some sort of finance, like, you know, JPEG and a few others. Um, I think, I do think it will, like the art market, like the the art market and luxury market and like loans for that type of use case is, is massive. And so I think you'll see some, but uh, I don't think, uh, I think a subset of NFTs do lend themselves fairly well for that. Uh, and I think you're seeing that with the type of also investors that are coming in and just sweeping floors. They don't necessarily have a particular attachment to Punk 9159 or six to whatever um and so but yeah I, I definitely see that more exciting thing is if it nfts as we think of them today is just purely kind of art but if it works for art then you can extend that to so many other use cases insurance contracts and i, I mean when i people talk about financialization of nfts i say well think of it an nft is just an liquid asset so if that's a real estate you know digitized real estate you know, contract or, or whatever insurance contract, or you can basically the fractionalization use case, I think is going to be much, much more interesting for things other than art. What is the room for, um, for like the crypto native brands, I guess I'd call them. Cause in this world that you're talking about here, Colleen and Peter, there's, um, like a lot of the big brands are coming into NFTs. It's like Reddit and uh, Starbucks and you know, you know they're coming into NFTs and then you've got like all right well who's going to do well in the crypto gaming space you've got like Ubisoft's and Take Two and Fortnite like what is the when you because obviously you two lead the the venture side of um, Revan Howard Digital where do you look to invest uh, in the gaming space right now? Oh let me let me answer the first part of the question yeah. first yeah. I think there's um I think there's an interesting answer there because um you know Alex Danko who runs blockchain for Shopify, had this great um, interview that he did with Packy McCormick on token-gated commerce and the power of cross-collaboration. So basically, I'm Gucci, and I want to reach Santiago, who's a punk holder. So I'm going to collaborate with you guys so I can get to all the punks holders, and I can introduce them to these Gucci products. It's almost like what Tiffany's did, right, with punks. So it's this cross pollinization. And I think that's where the magic really happens, where you bring these two communities together and you introduce them to each other. And that's where these crypto native brands and what's being built on the crypto side is so important. And a lot of the traditional brands really want to access those communities and vice versa. So, you know, when we think about investing in this space, well, the gaming space, let's go there really quick because. 
the way I think about investing in the gaming space is I don't really want to take single game risk. So if I look at the Apple App Store, there's like 900,000 plus games there. Google Play, I think it's 400 plus. Steam, 10,000 games a year. That tells me there's just a ton of content and I'm not better than anybody else at figuring out what's going to be a hit. So I want to be more on the Epic Games model side of things for Web3, where you've got companies building out all of the technology that's going to help bring that game to life. So it's almost like Fortnite is the tentpole for the Unreal Engine. And that's what we really look to invest in, like who's building out the tech that's going to bring these games to life. And maybe they have a tentpole mm -hmm. game that they're going to test everything out on as they then spread it out into the Web3 community. But that, that's where I, I really see the investing in Web3 games um, for us. Not to get too off track, but I do think about this a lot. Like, would you rather invest in an L1 that accrues like the MEV? For instance, if it has like L1 that has like great unit economics, they're just going to capture all this volume. Do you buy Fortnite secondary? Um, or do you think on a relative basis, like try to find some sort of tooling that is helping brands like um you know enter the space more of like a consultant which doesn't necessarily scale that well or do you invest in a wallet that like renders nfts really nicely i'm just kind of curious because sometimes you know it, it all really just boils down to on a relative basis and a risk adjusted basis like what is the best way to play this what we're seeing is a massive growth in nfts yeah and it, it's an interesting question to try to answer in the sense that um some of what I feel like we're investing in was almost unimaginable a year ago. So it's it's just changing so rapidly. So I think a, a good example here might be one of our portfolio companies, Horizon Blockchain Games. And what originally attracted us to Horizon was the game Skyweaver, which is um, a trading card game very similar to Magic the Gathering, but using NFTs. Um, but Horizon is so much more. They had to build a smart contract based wallet called Sequence that um, uses social logins. You've got uh, key recovery, like because they had to bring in non crypto people to play the game. So, first they had to build the wallet because they were so early. Then they built out an AMM for 1155s because trading cards are semi fungible. And they realized that they needed a internal, you know, vertical marketplace for those cards that now other companies building in Web3 are using. So it's like they've built these pieces of infrastructure that are making it easier for other Web3 game developers to come into this space. So it's um, but I, I can tell you when at, when I was at CMT Digital and we first invested in Horizon, I didn't realize that sort of exactly what this was going to grow into. And I think they will keep growing and iterating to sort of fill those needs. Um, so, it, it, so it's so it's kind of hard to say it, um, in that sense. Like, would I rather invest in like an L1 or a company like Horizon, you know, where I see very different and unique um, monetization verticals across what they're doing? Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't think I have a good answer to that. Hmm. There was one, one, one last point gaming prediction I want to talk about, and then we can move into the infrastructure side of things. And Peter, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about that. Um, uh, it was about gaming interoperability, which is funny because I think that's the kind of red, it's actually the wrong red pill moment for a lot of people. It's like maybe, especially for non-gamers, um, you're like, oh, I can take my, like I played Halo and I became a general and like I got these cool things. But then I was never able to move that into like my Madden game. Like, oh, that that sounds awesome. I'll be able to do that. Gamers oftentimes know that that doesn't actually happen, right? And I think you actually had the line like, said no one ever. I want to take my Peely skin out of Fortnite and drop it into Grand Theft Auto. Like, no, that actually is not what people desire. Um, so I'm curious just to hear where you guys think interoperability within games goes. Yeah. Um... So we think that the magic really happens when you get into the programmability and the composability of the gaming items. So, you know, one thing that we heard from a few teams um, building in the space is, you know, Jason, you're going to come in with your wallet and you've got some like really awesome doodle in there and you're going to connect into a game. Let's say it's like a Pokemon Go type game 
that's built for Web3. So you connect your MetaMask wallet. You've got your really awesome doodle in there. The game is going to recognize, and it's already ranked all the doodles that exist. So the, the game devs have said, okay, we're going to take punks. We're going to take doodles. We're going to take apes. We're going to take, you know, world of women, and we're going to rank all of the different NFTs. So when you enter, and we've obviously ranked our own in-game assets, we're going to say, okay, Jason's coming in. He might sort of be like a whale because this is a really expensive, cool doodle that he owns. So we're going to grant him a really awesome, um, let's say Charizard, which has a really high, like, um, you know, fight ratio. And when you enter the game, then you enter sort of with that superpower that you can then use in the game. So those are the kind of things that we're starting to see. Um, and I think that's where things start to get very interesting. So it's not necessarily like you said, dropping Peely in the GTA. It's more like how, and especially with the changes that Apple's made with um, privacy, like what are what are the unique user acquisition methods going to be in Web3 gaming that aren't really possible in Web2 gaming? And now they're even harder to do in Web2 gaming. And one is like through looking at what's in a wallet and then bringing those attributes into an existing game. Hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point. Like when you read actually transcripts of games and how they, you know, revenue has softened this year, they, they do allude to it's become very, very difficult to acquire users and much more expensive. Um, but just broadly, it doesn't, I think it extends even beyond gaming. It's just like totally. NFTs are the cookies. I mean, you're building an identity uh, and most people don't have uh, hundreds of wallets. They kind of have a, a wallet that is front facing and purposely do that. And I think that that trend will probably persist, um, especially if you, you start then getting a lot of benefits from brands. You enter a store, you scan something, you get an NFT that then gives you certain perks or discounts. Um, it's just not brands. It could be airlines. It could be really anything. Absolutely. Uh, you can even enter a country and scan. If you have certain NFTs, you get certain perks, you get, you know, it's so, it, it, it could be crazy. Some people might look at this and say, this is like Panopticon, like this is the true surveillance state. But uh, like, I think, you know, it just depends on, you know, people who use Twitter, Facebook, some of these social media platforms that are free, I think, understand that, you know, it's not really free, that it comes at a cost, I guess, of privacy. Hmm. I remember uh, Laura shared an episode of, in 2018 with Marco Santori. Um, and they were talking about crypto kitties actually and it was actually the first time i ever heard this but marco this, this was four and a half years ago marco's like it's not about crypto kitties it's about brands being able to track people in the new digital world and to give them opportunities for new experiential things and i heard that and i was like that makes no sense how, how are crypto kitties connect I was like, that, that just hit me that i just got reminded of that um all right i want to pivot into some market infrastructure stuff and maybe we can the the nice pivot into this would would actually be one of your predictions around like nft market infrastructure which was around um open and this was actually one of my predictions for the year as well which was open market share ends up falling and if you look back at the last at the bull market they had like 75 or 80 percent market share now they're hovering in the in the like 40 to 50 percent market share um I don't know if Peter or Colleen, who wants to take this, but one of your predictions was that OpenSea's market share would fall below 25%, which is a pretty substantial drop. So I would love to hear your uh, your thoughts on this. Yeah, I, I, I think either of us can speak to this. But yeah, it, in, you, I think you made the same exact project, prediction um, and that there's a lot of emerging competition for OpenSea that are picking away at different angles. You have you know, pseudo swap for, you know, AMM style floor trading, like blur for professional style trading, um, nifty swap um, for ERC 1155s, you know, rareable, et cetera. All of these um, more uh, kind of specific marketplaces that appeal to different users. And we think we're going to continue to see that as you see more gaming assets, as more you're seeing more fashion um, and luxury type assets, um, that it won't be a a one size fits all for everybody. Uh, it makes me think of, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but years ago, uh, there was this, uh, you know, graphic of uh, kind of a you know, banks being unbundled. And you had all these, each of these, you know, s s specific things that banks did, and they all turned into fintech startups. And I think we're going to see a lot of that in, uh, in crypto as well, as you have these kind of monolithic platforms that are built for everybody. 
and that gives the opportunity for more niche players to come in that serve certain user segments uh, better. And I think yeah, that's one of the things that we're going to see around NFTs. Can I take the other side of our, I know we all made this prediction. I agreed with this prediction. Let me try to take the other side of the prediction though, which is that if you look at marketplace businesses, there's usually a massive power law and you, you, usually it's a winner take all or winner take most market. Like if you look at, um, you remember the ride sharing boom of like several years ago, you had Uber and Lyft, but then you also had Via and Git. And uh, I, I forget, at one point there were like nine different ones in New York or yeah, Jason, uh, but what you're saying, though, is ride sharing is one very specific vertical, whereas NFTs, I think what Peter's saying is, like, there are very different types. It's like e-commerce, right? You have uh, Netaport A and, like, like if you look at the e-commerce composition, yeah, Amazon has a big, big chunk for particular categories, but then you still have luxury segment has whole new different, like, total different, you know, platform. You have Etsy, you have, of course, like, they all command a different kind of volume relative to the vertical that they're going after, but... Still, I think people from a discovery standpoint would much I mean, people are not buying like Gucci bags on Amazon. Gucci has never purposely sold their their product on Amazon because it just would, it goes, it's counter to the brand. What I'm saying is there are very different types of NFTs, right? But also yeah. like the, the, the question for me is more the, from a liquidity standpoint, perhaps that's where the aggregator comes in because you might have many front facing kind of marketplaces, but then. On the back end, you do need to perhaps like stitch together the liquidity. Well, and from a, well, also think about it from not just the, so good point on the liquidity, but also the user's perspective. Like, look at what I'll use, I'll keep with the Uber example here. Maybe it's a bad example, but like Uber is now layering on uh, like the ability to rent a car from Uber. So now you don't have like a place to go rent a car. You do it on Uber. You have the ability to deliver groceries on Uber. Um, And so it's like, usually these marketplaces end up, accumulating more and more basically verticals instead of like disbanding verticals. Um, I think that that might get hard because there are so many verticals. Like when I think I, Santiago's used the word discoverability and I think that's so important. Like when we think about gaming and all of the, I mean, are there going to be trillions of gaming NFTs? I mean, there's going to be so many of them. And then you're going to, for a specific game that you may be playing, you're going to want to figure out, like, how much experience does this particular asset have? What kind of, you know, at, like, you need to get really granular as to the different powers and attributes of these very specific assets. So I, I think you almost necessarily need specific verticals. Um, and, and I could even see where gaming ends up bifurcated into different types of games, like hyper casual games, you might end up with like one marketplace for those types of assets. You may have first person shooter marketplaces. Like I think it's going to be that massive. Um, And to have good user experiences and discoverability, I do think you end up with these different verticals. I just think we're so early. Yeah, and Yano, I do agree with you that marketplaces often tend to consolidate and liquidity is in one place. I do think the differentiation here is that there are kind of significantly different customer segments for different types of NFT. NFT is such a broad term that it covers so many different things. Um, and maybe the better example here is probably an even older example of the, the graphic of the unbundle, unbundling of Craigslist, which, you know, everything used to be sold through Craigslist. And then you had startups that came out that are specific for different types of services and housing and jobs and community and personals and like all of these things that it originally you would go to Craigslist for all became like hundreds of different startups um, that are more specialized for these, these niches. And I think that that's what we could see. I can, so for what it's worth, I complete, I think it will go that way as well. Like I think like Craigslist was like services and then people are like, Oh wait, there's a lot of kinds of services. And like even Amazon, it's like selling or uh, not just Amazon, but like selling things online. It was like, oh, there might be one place to like sell goods online or like sell collectibles with eBay, for example. And then it's like, ah, oh, there are a lot of kind of collectibles. So no, I, I also think it goes that way. And and also OpenSea for what it's worth, like I don't know if OpenSea people listen to this podcast, but like the NFT, even if they fall from 50% to 25%, but if your market grows by 100x, like they're going to be, I think OpenSea is going to end up doing pretty damn well. So. Yeah. Um, and of course they listen. 
everybody listens. <laughs> Santi and I uh, always joke about having a, a listener base of one, which is ourselves. But uh, I'm, I'm I'm glad to hear there are listeners to this thing. So, um, all right, Peter, I want to I want to stick with some of the market structure stuff and get away from it's a really good kind of first half of the podcast talking about gaming and NFTs. I do want to start talking about like trading and more traditional market infrastructure. Um, one of your trading predictions was that uh, Uniswap would overtake Coinbase. Um, as DEX spot trading market share reaches a new all-time high. That was the quote. So would love to just hear overarching thesis for this. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that this is going to be the year that we see significant and long overdue market structure changes for crypto trading. Um, and that's going to be a move towards more uh, non-custodial wallets. People are actually holding their own, their own crypto or non-custodial trading. Uh, which is more trading on DEXs instead of sexes, and and also trading in how the centralized market structure works as well. And we can get into that. But on the um, DEX versus centralized exchange um, share, and I think you guys might have already talked about this on a separate podcast as well. Um, but if you look at the the share um, of DEX trading, you know that peaked at about 17% in mid 2020, and then it came down, it's been around 10 or so. Um, certainly think that that is going, it's been rising recently, think that that will continue to rise and that will be 20 or 30% uh, this year. As again, more folks look to, they want to hold their own assets, don't want to trade on centralized exchanges, um, get more comfortable with that. So th that is certainly something that we think we will see. And we think that Uniswap will overtake Coinbase on a consistent basis. It has on specific days in the past had more volume than Coinbase. Um, but has, I would say, overall been catching up to Coinbase. And I think that it will definitively flip Coinbase this year on, on a volume perspective as part of that broader trend moving towards uh, DEX trading. I guess on this point, I want to get your take on something perhaps more broadly on DeFi, which is how do you see DeFi going forward in its existence from a like regulatory standpoint? There's uh, you know this sort of traveling rule, this... KYC component and interacting in like pools of capital, um, the tornado cash situation that happened this year, I thought was, you know, gave people a lot of pause into what does it actually mean to use Uniswap and Uniswap 101, you need the liquidity. You, people are, if people all of a sudden, if regulators make it really hard to, to supply capital and be a liquidity provider, then that will really make it impossible for DeFi. And so I'm kind of curious to get your take on how this all shapes up um, as an institution. Like, are you skewing more towards DeFi and what do you perhaps need to see from a regular or what do you think is going to happen from a regulatory perspective? Because it sounds like you're pro you're bullish on DeFi and decentralized finance versus, you know, regulatory arbitrage, stuff like FTX. But I'm curious how that all shapes up in your mind. Colleen, you want to take the regulatory side of that? Yeah, I'll take the regulatory <laughs> side of it. Yeah, it's, um, I think Sorry. here is where the disclaimer becomes really important too, because I think, you know, Peter and I have each been in this industry. Yeah, big letters, right? Disclaimer, <laughs> you do flashing bright lights flashing, at this part, yeah. Jason. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Peter and I have each been in this space for about nine years. And I I think we share um, the same sort of reason for being here. And, and that really is just building a system that is inclusive and open to everybody. And so our ethos on DeFi like runs deep. Now, as an institution um, that is heavily regulated in the United States and Europe and Asia um, and the Middle East, um, there are certain things that we can and cannot do uh, because of that regulatory umbrella that sits on top of us. And right now that does make doing um, significant activity in DeFi challenging. Um, what we think will happen from a regulatory standpoint, there's a couple things. Um, and, and obviously my answer is going to be pretty US centric. Um, in 2023 for DeFi, I don't think much will actually happen because we're so polarized. We've got some policymakers far on one end of the spectrum 
Brown and Warren and others on the other, so McHenry and Emmer. And I think it's going to be challenging for them to come together and find a framework that works for both sides. And now obviously we've got bifurcated um, House and Senate. So to come up with legislation that's going to pass both chambers in 2023, I think is going to be tough. Um, I think the positive side of that is for DeFi. So it gives DeFi more time to harden and grow and really prove its utility. And so I think that is really important. Um, I think the negative of not getting some kind of framework put in place in 2023 is we really need clarity. I mean, asset classification, not knowing what's a security and what's a commodity is, I mean, really bad for the industry. And we've seen that just, it, it's it's bad. And when I think about, you know, what kind of regulation we could end up with for DeFi, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, I think the more benign framework would be, you know, regulating the front ends, obviously not the protocols because you can't regulate them, but, you know, could Uniswap.org, um, KYC AML, you know, groups using the Uniswap protocol. Um, but then it is, well, what does that look like? You know, do they register as a broker dealer, as a registered investment advisor? What is that? I mean, obviously you would want a framework that is specific to DeFi, but that's going to be challenging to get. What you don't want is any kind of regulation. And I think this is where you were going um, at the beginning of this saying like U.S. registered investment advisors and broker dealers can't touch crypto. Like that's a problem, right? That, that is, um, you know, we can talk all we want about how we can't regulate Bitcoin because it's software running autonomously on the internet. But if something like that happens, that is really bad. Um, you know, I, I tend to think that we have enough support now politically that we won't end up in a situation like that, that we where we probably end up is some kind of front end regulation at some point. But I don't think it'll be 2023. Um, what is the, so FTX happened. Do you think that that is compresses the timeline to get regulation? Do you think that that is, do you see that as a positive or negative from a regulatory standpoint in 2023? Yeah. I, I mean, my answer is going to be a little bit odd. Um, because, you know, and, and if we were back in 2022 and we didn't have a divided house and Senate, I, I think we would have pretty quick reactive regulation that would get put in place. I think in 2023, it's going to be harder. In theory, FTX should help prove the case for DeFi, right? I mean, that, that, and that's where as an industry, I think like every day we have to remind ourselves that these systems are not safe yet. They need our protection, which means we need to be talking with regulators and policymakers to help them understand the benefit of DeFi. Um, but I actually do you, think, do you, yeah. No, I was gonna say, I think you're going to this. Do you actually think that FTX actually has helped regulators and and other you know folks understand the, the distinction between the decentralized protocols and, and centralized institutions servicing crypto? Some, some. I think some are going to see what they wanna see no matter what the reality is though. I think some have built up a narrative about what they think crypto is. And even if we explain all day long that the situation with FTX is no different than the situation with Archegos or with Madoff, like a fraud is a fraud, they're still going to see what they want to see. And crypto scares people. It's just scary. You know, we have the privilege all day of investing and seeing what the future is bringing. It's exciting. Regulators and policymakers only think about the risks. And that's why I think it's so important that we keep trying to bridge that gap and help them see what we get to see all day long. Like this future is really, really bright. Let's think about the opportunity. Risk is one half of the equation. Opportunity and benefits are the other. Um, so, but I, I think having a divided House and Senate in 2023 is, is actually going to help us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. From uh, not to get too off topic, but you know, I think from an, just going on this thread a bit more, 
Um, from a fundraising standpoint, you know, you're talking to sovereign wealth funds, other institutions that, uh, you know, just given the Brevin Howard brand and you carry a lot of weight, at least that's my opinion. Um, and, and you get to talk to a lot of these folks. Um, is it, I mean, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of, could be a lot of noise, right? Cause macros like has put a lot of people on hold because they don't want to take on more risk in their portfolio, but in, in these conversations, do they do? You, have you felt a shift in tone, saying for the reasons that they don't want to invest in crypto, saying you know what this whole FTX thing just further you know delays my interest in the in, in this sector? Uh, do you think how big of an impact do you think that is going to have from a fundraising standpoint and and getting institutions that have perhaps warmed up to the sector over the last couple of years, uh, but just now you know, may not because of FTX or may, I don't know. I'm curious to get, if you've observed a shift recently. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that the, you know, the folks that I talk to that are allocators um, that are, you know, seriously looking at allocating to the space, like they have bought into, okay, this is a, you know, a kind of a, a fundamental technological innovation here and this is going to really have a significant impact on the world and it, it's you know something that um you know we should be investing behind the timing of that i think has often been impacted by you have something like fdx happen and you know folks just want to take some more time to think about things and, and that absolutely makes sense and would be expected um but you know i think a lot of those conversations now or at least folks that i talk to are kind of what I went back to at the beginning, which is, okay, if you believe in this and that you want to be investing in the market, when do you want to be investing? Do you want to be investing you know, at the top of a hype cycle or trough? Like you obviously want to be investing in the trough and where we are in that trough, you know, you can't exactly time the market, but it's clear we're somewhere in there now. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So this would be you, the time to do it. You guys are, I mean, Brevin Howard made its name with uh, Macro. Uh, and so you have a whole side of that you may talk to or interact with, but perhaps you consult them right on this sort of everyone's now a macro expert on crypto Twitter. But I think you guys are actually incredibly very smart and some of the best macro thinkers out there. Um, how much of that factors into your thinking uh, in terms of allocating uh, versus, you know, getting paid 5% on treasuries? You know, I'm just kind of curious how you guys think about deploying and investing, maybe it's early stage, doesn't really matter because valuations have come down, but it, 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 there is a pretty high relative opportunity cost now uh, of taking on risk. And I guess I guess that's one part of the question. The second one that I'm perhaps more interested in, if you don't want to answer the first, it's fine, is like, do you think that on a relative basis, like the whole narrative is for Bitcoin has been, it's a hedge against, it's it's like a macro hedge, which it hasn't. And because crypto has never gone through a recession or like, a, you know, and, and now we are in that feels like. Uh, and so do you think that the narrative for Bitcoin is dead, meaningfully undermined, given the recent performance? And when allocators come back into the asset class, do you think that the relative percentage of capital that flows into the space just goes directly into something like a tech bet like ETH or Solana or whatever and just doesn't even think about Bitcoin? in their portfolio for, for, for digital assets. Yeah, for, from my view, so from a, the macro perspective, um, I think being at a place like Brevin, there's a lot of brilliant macro folks here. It's great to get at that insight. Our investments are, as you mentioned, largely early stage. So it's, it's not like we're trying to time the market um, and we're looking for great founders and great companies and, the macro outlook at the moment doesn't really impact that too much. Maybe it impacts, you know, timing of deployment of capital a little bit and those types of things. But I would say not a, not a huge impact from my perspective. The Bitcoin narrative question, I think, is a really good one. Um, and then what what is that narrative going forward? I believe that this year the outside money uh, narrative for Bitcoin is really going to reemerge. Um, and that is that, you know, most money in the world is it's inside money. It's inside the, the banking system, specifically the U.S. banking system. And if you are, you know, the U.S. can seize that money at the end of the day. If you're, you know, Afghanistan or Russia, whoever you might be, um, you don't really own that 
those assets. Uh, you know, it's subject to the whims of somebody else. Uh, so there's, I think, going to be increasing demand around the world for a lot of reasons for outside money, things like Bitcoin, gold, commodities. Uh, that was something that earlier, you know, last year, I think, got some, um, you know, interest from a narrative perspective. I, I think that that will come back this year. And I think it is uh, an interesting narrative for Bitcoin. I think at the end of the day, Bitcoin is a better gold. I think that that is the kind of winning narrative for, for Bitcoin. Um, you know, ETH could somewhat fall in that category as well. I think Bitcoin's a, a pure play on that belief. Uh, ETH is more of a tech bet. Um, yeah, that, 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 those are my, my thoughts on that one. Pauline? Oh, I largely agree with Peter. And I think you got to throw Bitcoin some love. It's his 14th birthday from launch day today. So we've got to like, no, I mean, I, I agree quite a bit. And I think also, you know, I, I agree with everything he said. Um, and I do think, you know, when institutions do financial institutions um, and others, you know, when they come back into this space, I do think that, you know, it'll it's going to be interesting, the timing, right? Like, have we made any progress on the regulatory asset classification side of things? And is the SEC increasingly aggressive on enforcement as to what is and is not a security? And does that almost force, if you're going to go into an L1, does that almost force you into Bitcoin? Because it, it really is the only asset that enjoys like a pristine regulatory moat. You, you know, Ethereum should be in that category. But of course, we've heard like rumblings, you know, back and forth as it is it not a security. I think the fact that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange has, you know, issued Ethereum based products should put it in the commodity camp. But nonetheless, it's like I do think that that continues to be a factor. Like what can institutions actually invest in from a regulatory standpoint, assuming they're heavily regulated and conservative? Mm -hmm. I want to do a, a three fire round questions on regulation, and then we can move on. <laughs> One is so if, if you could entertain that, that'd be great. Always, it's always One, it's always terrifying when Santi throws that the right. Yeah, yeah no, 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 I'm like on, I'm on, really on. afraid here. I'm going to do my <laughs> no, best. No, no. Do we need no, more like, disclaimers here, Santi? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, trust me, we'll make all the disclaimers. Red light. Sorry. Um, one, do you do we see another El Salvador this year, like legal tender for Bitcoin? Or yes, is it a developed or developing country developing okay like a peru think, or mexico i think a lot more we might see that i think more impactful than legal tender laws are central banks accumulating bitcoin or eth and i think mm -hmm. i don't know if we'll see it this Which year they they might have the next already, years. but they're yeah. not and you think they'll and, be public about it i think at first they won't be public i think it could be happening now i think it's likely happening now uh but they're not public yeah. about it I mean, yeah, Russia has just sort of intimated that they want to settle with Bitcoin and, and that could have a whole host of issues, but I won't even get there. That's not a viral question. I guess I was going to ask more on a relative basis. You talk about the U.S. being pretty divided. Do we see a big regulatory action, good or bad, from, you know, in the U.K. or the European Union uh, that then the U.S. adopts as a framework? Hmm. That's a really great question. Um, do I have to do yes or no? Uh, no, you can you could sort of like expand okay. on it. Because I mean, I Depends. think historically, um, you know, I've always thought that the U.S. kind of sets the framework and then other countries follow. And um, I think it might be getting to the point where we see other developed countries. So what's happening um, in Europe, U.K., start to become what sets the standard um, on things like asset classification and how to handle that, where the U.S. ends up actually following the frameworks that have been set elsewhere. I think crypto may be what actually shifts that. Um, I don't think historically we've really seen that. But on I the think, ETF side, I think it was like the gold ETF. I mean, you might know the history well, but it was like, I think in the UK, the US dragged its feet and the UK kind of approved that and then the US adopted that. On the financial right. innovation side, I think it's been Europe, Europe has been a little bit more cutting edge. Maybe the last one bonus question. Do we have a major, uh, a major insolvency collapse this year that we haven't seen? And if so, well, where do you think that comes from? Because it felt like all the dominoes will fall at this point. Maybe Binance. Peter, that one's you. <laughs> I'm off the regulatory hot seat. Uh, uh, 
major? Uh, I don't think so. Like, I, I don't think like it's te- easy. Maybe more specifically, t- Tether and Binance. Tether and Binance, I don't think so. I think you're, there's going to be continued aftershocks of the FTX thing that, you know, folks are going to go out of business. Um, yeah, don't know for sure, but I, I would be surprised if there was Binance or Tether issues. Do you think we see any major tier one crypto venture firms go down? Oh, that's good. Depends what you not define us. as tier one. <laughs> <laughs> who do you well, define as... I, I guess if it goes down, it's not a tier one. But you know, like in you... terms of like a, a big yeah. one, like a greater than three, four, or five hundred million in AUM. I don't know. It, it. I think that there are. There's probably a number of funds that are in a tough spot because they're down so deeply, um, and we'll need to make some you know tough decisions on do they carry on? Do they um, you know try to claw their way back? Do they start a new fund? Do they? You know, how do they manage that situation? So I, th- I think we're going to see probably some changes just because of the, the dynamics that you get yourself into if you're a fund and you're down 80%. I guess it's fun. I, I want to keep going. Does Coinbase get acquired? Yeah, reason, reason, reasonable chance of that. I, I think that that is a, could be a very attractive asset for a large financial institution. Well, you, here, you, let, me, let me piggyback on the Coinbase question. Will Coinbase... This was actually one of your predictions that I I thought this was a really interesting prediction that custody and settlement yeah. are going to have to separate. Like right now, uh, exchanges in crypto are not actually just exchanges. They're exchanges plus brokerage, uh, plus custodians, plus clearing and settlement houses. Do you think that Coinbase will be forced to separate these sides of their business? Uh, no, not Coinbase. Coinbase will continue to, to operate altogether. Um, I think it works well for Coinbase. Um, it's one of the few places that it works well. Um, Generally, um, as you mentioned, this is a weird or it's a, a, a different market structure. You know, traditionally you don't have a brokerage and exchange and a, a, a settlement, uh, you know, agent all together in in one uh, in one entity. Uh, crypto grew up that way because there wasn't you know third parties to do it. When Coinbase started, they needed to do this all themselves. I think it works at a place like Coinbase because uh, they are a they're a trusted custodian, they're a trusted exchange. Like they, you can trust them to do all these things. In my view. Um, there are lots of exchanges where traders, market makers trade on. They don't want to have their assets there, and they haven't wanted to have their assets there for years. Um, but they have put their assets there because that's been how you make money: is you you trade on these these uh, you know uh, these other exchanges. And that's always been something that you know for years. Me and Colleen have been talking about this. Like traders, market makers have been pushing for. We don't want to hold our assets on the exchange. We want to hold them with a trusted custodian or ourselves, more, more likely a third-party custodian. You give us credit on the exchange for it. We all settle at the custodian. Like That is a typical market structure, and that is what traders would like. It's more, it's way less risk. It's more capital efficient. There, there's just a lot of benefits from having that t- type of market structure. Uh, historically, exchanges have basically said no. Like If you want to trade on our exchange, give us your, give us your coins, give us your cash. Um, and traders have consented to that. Post FTX, that is finally trade changing, where traders are saying, like, no, if you want our volume, you want our liquidity, you, we're going to hold it at Fireblocks, we're going to hold it at Bitco, we're going to hold it at Copper, and you're going to give us credit for it, and we're going to settle it at the, the custodian. And if you don't, if you won't sign up for that, we're out. And that that this year, like, the line is getting drawn on that, and that is going to get make market structure change. Mm-hmm. On the on this piece, like uh, I guess you guys are active traders. You have a whole component that you know is building really interesting infrastructure. Uh, we've seen liquidity really dry up uh, in crypto, uh, especially for tail end assets. Who do you think uh, fills that void? I mean, we've talked about DeFi, perhaps, uh, but I'm curious. Like, do you think that we'll see the rise and someone really you know come in and fill that that gap? And where is that going to come from? Or liquidity is liquidity going to be really an issue in 2023? I think markets will be less liquid in 2023 because you know market makers have pulled back uh, for good reasons. Um, it creates an opportunity, I think, for new players to enter the space that maybe wasn't there before uh, to play in you know some of these spots and some of these assets that the bigger players you know don't want to play in, perhaps. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th- I think that you know we're we're in a spot right now where I think everybody's got to pull back for good reason. 
um, folks are going to, you know, lean forward, I think, more as the year goes on. And it, we're also probably going to see some new entrants come into the space to fill some of those gaps. Uh, I think we're going to see that from a, from a trading perspective. I think we're going to see that from a lending perspective. I think a lot of these, you know, places where people have gotten burned, like that's when new opportunities arise for folks to come in and, you know, do it, you know, have better risk management and, you know, do those types of things, but do it in a better way. Mm -hmm. This is a question for both of you, and it's not a fly around question. It's more just kind of thinking about all everything that we've talked about so far, which is um, what do you think are going to be the biggest narratives of the year? I mean, we've talked about gaming, NFTs. Uh, I'm thinking more from the lens of like last cycle, it was really DeFi that got started, the kind of the, the bull run. Um, and then that extended into NFTs, but it was really kind of the compound, like launching of this liquidity mining program that got everything um, on on high gear. What is that? One, do you think that we're, we'll see that kind of phenomenon in 2023? Um, or what happens in terms of maybe not in 2023, but what do you think are going to be the biggest narratives this year, whether we are in a back in an up only market or, or not? Yeah, I, I don't know if we'll have that that moment in 2023. I hope we do. I think it could come from a few different places. I think you could have a, a a really good Web3 game that goes viral. And it's actually really fun to play and has, you know, assets, NFTs in it that uh, people truly own. And, you know, that could go viral and attract a lot of new users. I think you could have branded goods that come in that there is, you know, just some really cool an existing brand or a new Web3 native brand that, you know, where people just get really excited about the brand and they want to be part of it and they want to own the assets. And then that could kick things off again. Um, I think the payments narrative is is never going to be something that gets really hot. It's just going to be slow adoption in the background and slowly kind of changes the way the money moves across the world. But it's not going to um, kind of kick off, uh, you know, excitement in the market per se. Um, but those would be things around gaming or branded goods would be my guess on it. Like if we have that that moment, uh, Colleen, you probably have better perspective. No, I mean, obviously, that's where I spend the vast majority of my time. And that's where I do tend to think we'll continue to make progress in 2023. The way I think about it is, you know, to me, DeFi summer was so crypto native. Um, obviously, we brought in non-crypto people, but it really was crypto native. And it was complicated, unless you were sort of in the weeds of it, right? Right. Um, I, you know, I, I remember that somewhere so vividly, like just, to, you know, you, everything you had to like learn by doing, um, and really like make a lot of mistakes and figure it out. And I, I think, and, and sort of hope that where we're moving to in 2023 is that we're starting to ab you know, abstract away some of those complexities where it's just easier and easier for people to come into this space where we almost don't even know if it's going to be like an NFT summer or a DeFi summer. Like it'll just be, people are just using this stuff because it's making their lives better. Like that's really my hope for 2023. And I, I do think we're starting to see that like actual avenues of monetization that are real and net new and enhancing you know, and I do like the word enhancing, like when I think about gaming, like, you know, Peter and I aren't at the place where we're looking to invest in like games being built 100% on chain with the decentralized game engine like that. That's not where we are. Do we hope we get there in you know 10 years? Yeah, that'd be great. But I mean, we I, I think it's like these sort of baby steps where we're going to have this conversation a year from now. And hopefully we're going to look back at 2023 and say like all these incremental steps like really added up to something significant. Um, that's what I hope in 2023. So it may I, not I, be like a big thing, but just like we keep getting there. I, I completely agree with that. Like I think that the like how do you get the next you know billion people or a huge amount of people into crypto, onboard them into crypto, is that you don't. You don't onboard them into crypto. Crypto powers things that they want to do. Like they want to play great games. They want to buy, you know, digital items online that, that resonate with them in some way. They want to move money around the world and pay people, uh, you know, seamlessly or save in dollars or those types of things. And like crypto is behind all of those services and enables them to do those things in a better way. But they are not, they don't identify themselves as Web3 people or crypto people are onboarded into crypto. They're just, they're using services that happen to use 
crypto in the back end. And I, I, I think that that's a lot of what we're going to see this year. Mm -hmm. I have two, I have two DeFi questions and then we can start to think about wrapping this up. Um, one is, do you think we'll see a tier one DeFi application, like a, let's say a Uniswap compound, Aave, someone like that, lean into the app chain thesis and launch and, and kind of move, move on to their own app or build, build their own app, or excuse me, build their own chain. Uniswap being the, the obvious one here. I can never tell if you guys know something that you're not supposed to say publicly, which is I'm assuming <laughs> what it is when you I, don't answer yeah, me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think for Uniswap, I, I think that they've come out and said that they, they don't plan to actually do that. Um, will we see it for one of the more blue chip DeFi protocols? I think like, I mean, DYDX is doing that. So I don't know if you you know consider them to be in that category, but you know they're, they're leading the way in doing that. Will we see more folks do that and say, hey, I'm going to have an app chain. I can control more of the uh, you know, value capture by doing that? Um, I think probably. I, I would say in general, we are less excited about the app chain thesis than I think a lot of uh, VCs. Um, but we'll probably see some of that. Yeah. I think my last one, and then we can throw it back to Santi to, to close this up, is... Um, uh, one of the narratives that drove DeFi was that you could get high yields in DeFi. Now that's kind of flipped on its head, right? I can actually get a higher yield through through my like through a rob through putting money on like parking money on Wealthfront or Robinhood. I can get like four percent treasuries. Yeah, and, and I, through treasuries exactly. Um, will we be able to get like access to like the 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 yield that comes from the ten year in DeFi in twenty twenty three? And if so, does that drive? I don't know if these are related questions. Um, in my mind, they are. But like, will that drive this like permissioned DeFi use case? I don't know. The, like the how do you bring treasuries into DeFi or that type of yield into DeFi? At that point, it, it, I kind of start to question like, what are you solving for? Like, if, if you want treasury yields, go buy treasuries. Like, you don't need the DeFi part of it. Um, I do think that there's an interesting market opportunity right now for like a fintech to just like make it easy to buy treasuries for millennials and Gen Z. I completely agree. Um, yeah. but, well, there's also a nice yeah. there's also a nice arbitrage going on, which like you can borrow in DeFi and then just buy the ten year right now, which you got to imagine you that gap close. Can't really borrow. Can't be really borrow fixed and scale or efficiently fixed yeah, term, so yeah, that makes true. it difficult. That's true. But yeah, yeah. There, there you really are being your own bank. You're borrowing short, lending long. That's a uh, bank. Um, exactly. All right. Uh, yeah, but the like the yield, um, yeah, I don't know if it, I, I am excited. Long term, like uh, like the crypto credit market lending in, in, uh, in DeFi, I do think it's really interesting because it does create a whole new way for like capital to move across the world from folks that have capital to those that need capital in ways that I think is more open and can be more efficient than the current system. Um, but yeah, right now, like that market, as you mentioned, like yields are really low. It's not really very attractive. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this has been a fascinating discussion. I, I still remember when we met uh, right before the, the tarot was going down the summer and uh, I think things have happened, uh, more things have happened. So I think it's really hard to predict things that can happen in crypto. Uh, but I think creating predictions is still a useful exercise to go back and think about why you came up with those predictions. So I guess I have two, two closing questions. Like one, as it relates to this art of coming up with predictions, I'm curious um, where you guys have historically been very wrong in terms of if you look, for instance, at the predictions that you did in 2022 or 2021 or historically, um, maybe for listeners to, to understand what kind of goes into this process, um, uh, you're predicting you're very good in terms of where have you looking back, where have you like made the biggest mistakes or what is that has like surprised you the most, I guess. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Well, I know one area for me for sure is like the institutions are coming. I mean, I think. Once I really understood the power of Bitcoin, because that's, of course, where, you know, everything started for me. Um, 
it's like you think everybody's just going to get it and be in the space. Like I just, I um, really expected adoption to be much quicker, especially with financial institutions coming into the space. Um, I also think one area where I was naive in the beginning was not appreciating that when you are creating technology around money, you're causing a lot of fear. And, um, and I think that, you know, it's very different than the internet, right? And opening up information, you know, when you're doing this with money, things just take longer. I mean, we are living, what a unique period of time we're living in and working in this industry. Like we are rewriting how money works. And I, I think where I just have sort of constantly missed a little bit is just the time it takes for adoption. Um, if I look back on things, but I think, you know, coming up with predictions, if, if, you know, anytime you have to sort of put pen to paper and challenge what you think, I, I think is, is a, always a useful exercise. Like, can you support what you think is going to happen with data? Or like, even when I think about gaming and brands, like where I constantly would push myself is how, how does this make the consumer life better? And how do brands and gaming companies make money? Like both those sides have to work for this thesis to be valid and for these predictions to actually come true. And um, it's actually not a very easy exercise. Like you really have to read a lot and think a lot and write a lot and throw things away. Um, but but I think where I've gotten it wrong over time is just the just how much time it takes to build. Mm -hmm. Peter? Yeah, I think historically, I was just trying to look back at some of my predictions. Um, Peter gets them all years, right. I, 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 I would, I like to say my track record is is pretty good historically. Um, like 2020 and 2021, I think they were, they were quite good. 2022 was less good. Uh, I was too too bullish, like a lot of people uh, coming into 2022. Um, and I think like where I have gotten things wrong, one is the speed that things move. Um, I think that often things just take a little bit longer than you think or hope they will, especially when you're dealing with, you know, institutions, for example. Um, I would say the second is maybe getting caught up in, like, what is the kind of the hot thing of the moment that people are, like, everyone is excited about. Um, or, you know, maybe things that you've made an investment in that, that you know, you, you want to happen, but maybe, uh, you know, isn't really um, the right theme. And I think that, like, where... I've generally gotten things right is where you come back to like the first principles of like why these things matter and what is the impact that they can have. Um, and where does the data show that actually starting to happen? Um, and like that, I think is like the more first principles type thinking, um, I think is generally where I've, I've gotten things more right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, my last question is, uh, and feel free to pick the order uh, uh, because it might influence your answer depending on who goes first, which is what are some of the things that you disagree with the most, both of you, as you think about when you're making investments or thinking about your worldview? Um, what are some of the things that you constantly or, or really disagree with in your crypto worldview? That, that oh, we man. disagree with in each other with or disagree with like the broader consensus? Uh, great. Uh, I actually would want to know both, but perhaps starting with where the Peter and Colleen, where you don't agree with, and then where you perhaps have a very specific view that the crypto world doesn't agree with. Okay, I'll start. And then Peter can tell you all the things where he thinks I'm insane. But I mean, <laughs> part of uh, part of the reason I'm, I feel so grateful to have Peter as a partner is I think investing in crypto is actually pretty hard. I don't think it's easy. And I really do feel if I can't convince Peter that this is a good investment, then I shouldn't do it. I, I really believe that. Um, I trust his judgment so much. Um, and as you can tell from this conversation, we tend to focus on different areas. And I think that's really healthy because if I can't pull Peter along, or if he's not engaged um, or doesn't see merit 
then I usually tend to think I'm probably missing something and I need to look at that harder. To me, that's the value of having a true partner. Um, so I, I don't, I, like, I really, truly can't think of areas where I disagree with Peter. I mean, we definitely have healthy conversations. Um, and, I, you know, and we see things in different ways, but it's kind of like that combination that I think makes us better together. Uh, I know certainly than I am separate. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with that. I think that me and Colleen are really good compliments and that's why I came over to Brevin to, to work with her um, in that we, we certainly have different interests. Um, a lot of our interests over, also overlap, uh, but we, we look at things in slightly different ways. And I think that we broadly have, we're typically in agreement on the broad themes and then it's the kind of the nuances within that that we have really good discussions on. And the same thing, like if, if I can't convince Colleen something that is a good idea, it's probably not a good idea. Um, and it's a good kind of check on, on my thinking. In terms of, I mean, we've discussed a lot of predictions here, but just they don't have to relate to this, but where, where do you think that uh, the crypto market or generally the world doesn't agree with particular things? That, this is sort of the thing that what do you believe in now that others don't, but will at some point? Well, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I think we all like have the reason, like, I mean, if 2022 didn't test us on like why we're in this space and why we're staying in this space, um, I, I don't really know what will. And the way I tend to think about things, and again, it's like all these steps along the way, like, um, you know, I firmly believe like we're going to get to a place where everybody through this technology has an opportunity to create wealth and generate wealth for themselves. Um, you know, and, and just a tiny example, like in the context of gaming, you take a company like Roblox, 100% of its value is generated by the creators on that platform. The first time they could participate and generate wealth through Roblox was when it went public at 41 billion. Like that doesn't make any sense. And I think, and, and this is fraught with regulatory risk right now, but we will eventually get to a place where we open up these systems so that the people that create value can also generate wealth for themselves along the way. And I think that's like the power of building open systems that everybody can access. So I, I feel like that's the thing that I see, <laughs> but I don't know how long it's going to take us to get there. But um, I feel like that's like if I have a secret, like, hey, I know, like someday, like, you know, this kid in a stroller, like you're going to generate wealth through these open systems that we're working so hard to build and protect and nurture. Mm -hmm. I feel like mm -hmm. that's what. Yeah. Before Peter goes, it's sort of like uh, a lot of people now are questioning rightfully so, like, what does this all matter? What are the actual tangible use cases beyond this being a 24-7, 365 casino? And it's like, well, go talk to an artist. Uh, and, 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 and I compare that to what like Sotheby's and Christie's like rips them off with, uh, and the ability to access the distribution network of the internet to sell their art without having to go through a gallery and, or someone that can monetize their content much better than what YouTube is extracting. And so anytime you kind of see that, it's sort of a force that once you see that, you don't go back. Once you transfer a stable coin, yeah, it can be hard. You think about security and all these things, but if you extract like the, the, the use case is, is there is real. Uh, whether people want to see it or not, but you know the creators certainly have appreciated that. If you look at NFTs and and gamers, will certainly appreciate that. Um, you know, people forget that some of the best builders in the space have had bad experiences in gaming. None starting with Vitalik. Uh, but uh, but yeah, totally. definitely agree with that. Uh, but Peter, yeah, as far as what I believe that others don't believe, I think that a lot of the maybe things I believe became more consensus over the last couple of years. Uh, I would say right now, I would say it's the the scale that I believe these things will go to and the conviction that I have that they will reach that scale. Like I am absolutely certain that, I shouldn't say absolutely certain, I have, I have a high degree of confidence that like stable coins are going to be a double digit trillion dollar market, that, that that's going to be the new euro, euro dollar market that digital goods that you actually own, NFTs, will be a larger market than physical goods sales. 
that you know central banks will hold digital assets they will hold bitcoin and eth um like these are things that i think are fairly inevitable i think that that is maybe a non-conviction belief that i don't think that these are likely to happen i think that these are unev- inevitable things that will happen i don't think i could get more bullish but this made me even more bullish uh, yeah no, Colleen and uh, and Peter, this is this is a great start to the year, and I think uh, Santi and I both share in your optimism for the year. Uh, and it, it the optimists usually win in life, so I'm uh, I'm, I'm glad to see you guys are staying optimistic. Yeah. And um, yeah, this was an amazing chat. Yeah, I'm really happy both of you came on. I mean, obviously, you guys have done incredible work, uh, and it's been largely in the background. And so I know I've pushed you and Melanie and others in your team to say you got to be more public about all the great stuff that is happening, because it's really nice to see someone like Brevin or Alan, uh, Brevin Howard, move into the space because I, I I can't think of an institution of that size, reputation, to really just, you know, you certainly had like Paul Tudor Jones and, you know, Soros and a few other like big guys that come into the space. But I don't think it's been to the level of commitment in terms of not just investing, but also building. Um, and I think there was, a, for people that want to learn a little bit more, because Alan's been, you know, it's, he's, he's sort of in the background. He's not a very public guy. Um, but there's a great, I thought it was a great financial times, um, profile on, on Alan and what, and his vision and, and your team's vision on, on digital assets, crypto and the industry. And so maybe we'll link it to the show notes, but it's great to see you guys, uh, come out and, and be more public about your strategy and your conviction in the space. Um, which is, seems like, uh, not really going away or unwaving, especially in spite of everything that's going on. So it's great to see. Uh, that and and thank you both for coming on the show. Uh, I'm sure listeners will appreciate that. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. It's been a lot of fun. I feel like it's um you know we're obviously friends with you guys as well as uh you know being on here. And it's um when I think about everything we've all been through, and I think about people like you guys, like it's um you know that's equally the reason to be here and to stick around. Like it's such great people. I think um so. Thank you for all the work you guys you. do. Yeah. I know that Thank I look you. forward yeah. well, to running because I get to listen <laughs> to you. So there we go. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it's your, well, your guys' weekly. Uh, you know, listen to you guys every week. That, that's what keeps us going. So we, we appreciate <laughs> nice. it. Now you can yes. listen to yourself. Right. Yeah, listen to your own voice. <laughs> yeah, now listen to yourself. Well, we'll have to we'll have to have you guys back on before the end of the year so we can compare. Um, um, you know how these predictions uh, shaped up, but what uh, I'm sure this year will be. Uh, crypto is always a uh, great entertainment value. So, you know, we'll yeah. have to have you guys back on uh, later on in the year to talk about yeah. this. Pretty. Colleen, Peter, thanks so much, guys. Thanks.